Okay, so sorry for the delay. Um, now we're happy to have Dario Stein talk about overdrawing urns with sign probabilities. Thanks. Okay, people uh, online, can you hear me? I wouldn't know how to find out. I hope this all works. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm uh, going to present some work with uh, Bart Jacobs on sign probabilities. And this is really a kind of um, pearl of categorical probability. So I'm taking a bunch of concepts which are well known and then combining it in this really fun and new way. And I think it should be, should be appealing for you all. So uh, let's think about a very classical statistical experiment. We have an urn and we draw balls from it and we draw balls without replacement. So let's just start with uh, there's one uh, zero and one one in this urn. We draw the first thing. So then uh, the probability that we draw the zero and the one is both half, fair enough. We make a second draw and we know what the second draw has to be given the first one. So to see the sequence zero one, to see the sequence one zero, this will have probability half. And of course we can never see zero zero and one one because there's only one of each of the balls, so those have probability zero. And now the urn is empty and the story could be over. But what if we want to keep drawing? Let's draw a third ball from this urn that only contains two. And it works. So we now get a distribution over sequences and it turns out all these sequences have probability one quarter. But there are six of them, so we have more than probability one. So we just subtract some. So the sequence is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1 have probability minus one quarter. And that is really odd. And I mean, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. But let's see what still makes sense here. So probabilities now do add up to one because we have six quarters and then we subtract two quarters. So that's fine. It also like, it looks reasonable. It still respects the symmetry between zero and one and so on. And also the marginals work out correctly. So if we take the distribution over three sequences, and we want to go back to the distribution of a two sequences by just throwing the last thing that we drew away, then the calculation checks out. So for this one, we add a quarter plus a quarter is half. In this one, we add a half plus minus a half, we get zero, as it should be, yes. Sorry, as the village idiot, I'll ask the question. Um, how are all of these equal to a quarter? You mean why? Why, sure. Oh, that's the story, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get there. So I'm showing you the result, which is that this works oddly, but where the heck does this come from? <laughs> <I'm> very excited. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, so uh, how do we approach this? Um, let's uh, take a step back and say, so there's three kind of uh, ways that we can interact with these urns, and I want to compare them. The first one is called this hypergeometric, which is the fancy way for drawing without replacement. And this is what I want to talk about, but there are two other modes that are related. So there's multinomial drawing, which is the very simple drawing with replacement. So it means my urn never actually changes. This is the simplest way. This is state-free. It's In statistics, it's called an IID draw because the distribution of each of the draws is independent and it doesn't change. And then there's this funny mode of drawing, which is called a polya draw, and that is less well known. A polya draw means I draw a thing from the urn, put it back, but then when I put it back, I actually put two copies back in. So the urn grows every time I draw from this. So this models a kind of the rich get richer phenomenon. Let's say the things are uh, successes and losses. So if I succeed, then in the future, I have a larger probability of succeeding again because the success was kind of added to the urn. And uh, so the interesting thing is all of these uh, different types of drawing are what's called exchangeable. And exchangeable means that uh, if I give you a sequence of outputs, then the order in which I observe my draws does not matter. It's kind of all just about the counts. Uh, for multinomial, this is clear. For hypergeometric, you can convince yourself of it. For polya, this is really weird because we have this the rich get richer thing. So it could be that once I have the first win, I kind of like run away and at the end of time I'm a monopolist. But this is not what happens here. So we can see the sequence one, 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 zero, zero, like uh, two wins first and then two losses has, you go through the calculation, the same probability as the sequence zero, one, zero, one. These things like they, they go on a big fraction and they kind of all uh, cancel each other out. So uh, yeah, that's an interesting observation. All these uh, earned models are exchangeable. 
And uh, what's, what it lets us do is drop talking about sequences altogether and just talk about multisets, which are uh, well, like sequences, but modulo reordering. So we have some kind of probability channels for all of these hypergeometric draws, which goes to multisets, multinomial draws and polyer draws. With the one exception that uh, multinomial and polyer, you can run this to the end of time. These urns either stay the same or keep growing. But hypergeometric has this weird restriction where we can only do this finitely many times because at some point the urn is gone. And then what do we do? And I would like to do this forever, but then we, we can't. So that's why we need to generalize the story. So first thing to notice is that hypergeometric can really not be extended um, exchangeably. I mean, I could extend it somehow, but I want to keep this exchangeability property. The problem is this, if I start with an urn with n elements and I draw n times hypergeometrically, I know exactly what I'm going to get. I'm going to get that urn because I've emptied it. I've moved from here to here. So hypergeometric of n of this urn is, and cat notation just means Dirac delta, is that urn that I put in. But if I'm exchangeable and I have n draws, it means I can do n plus 1 draws, and then just drop a random element and get back to my n draws. So this means hypergeometric n is hypergeometric n plus 1 composed with a drop a random element channel. But if we could do this, it would mean that we decompose a deterministic measure, so a vertex of a probability simplex, into a non-trivial mixture of kind of other things, and that can't work in probability. Like, that's, uh, that's how the geometry looks. So hypergeometric cannot be extended uh, exchangeably, at least in the world where probabilities are non-negative. And that's where the negative things come in. So the task is, can we find infinite exchangeable but signed extension of hypergeometric? Turns out we can. It turns out there's even many possibilities of doing it. So the answer is kind of non-canonical. And I want to present the, the, I would say, easiest or most canonical answer to this. And why is it canonical? Because I look at the, the three modes here polya multinomial, and I kind of keep the analogy between the two as well as I can. So the story has three ingredients that we need to talk about. Negative probabilities, which are relative, e relatively easy to introduce. Then a result called Definetti's theorem, which is all about this exchangeability. And then Bernstein polynomials, which are the kind of mathematical star of the show. And then it all comes together really nicely. So signed probability, negative probabilities have appeared in physics all over the place, like some of the famous physicists talk about it in the context of quantum, but it also sometimes shows up in like queuing theory or finance, and people mainly use this as a kind of calculational tool, and everyone tracks a bit what the meaning of that should be, fair enough. What is that operationally? I don't know, they say just, just calculate. But the ideas around uh, formally, this theory is actually really easy. So, you know about distribution monads. We can define the signed distribution monad, d, d plus minus, as, well, convex combinations, but we don't uh, insist that numbers be positive. So then it's not a convex combination, it's an affine combination, but it has all the usual geometry, and you take the classic category, and that's a Markov category, and everything works. Well, on this formal level, it just has some funny caveats that distinguish uh, signed probability from ordinary probability and uh, theory of Markov categories is really nice to say what's going on. So one thing that happens is this does not have conditionals. It cannot have conditionals in general. There's really nice obstructions to that. Uh, also, yeah, Dirac distributions which were indecomposable before, now we can decompose this. This is kind of why we're doing that. And then like this, this really weird counterexample that I love showing is that constants in signed probability can be correlated to each other. So I can come up with two coins, X and Y, which are both one with probability one, but they are also not equal with probability one. So the probability that X equals Y is, is zero. And how do we do it? We give this, these three things half, and then we give this minus half, and you calculate, and that's, that's what comes out. So, some weird stuff, but still formally these things work. Operationally, I don't want to say too much, but uh, I realized recently that if we do probabilistic programming, usually the way um, programs work is we run a trace of it and then it outputs pairs of an output and a likelihood or some sort of weight that it accumulated. And at the end we do Monte Carlo sampling, so we generate lots of these traces and and uh, some things up and average. And I mean, no one stops us from emitting negative weights 
somewhere there. Of course, we can divide by zero or something, but if, if this doesn't happen, this is a valid probabilistic program. And you see here, at this point, it generates a score of minus one, but you run it and it really, it really produces this distribution as it should. So yeah, maybe that's, that makes it uh, a bit less weird operationally. But that's all I want to say about sign probabilities. Now, I do want to talk about uh, Definetti's theorem, which is kind of your bread and butter for exchangeable sequences. Um, so one way of creating an infinite exchangeable sequence is this. I start with a distribution over distributions, and then when I want to create the sequence, I first get a distribution from the distribution of the distributions. That is this psi. And then every time I want a new element of the sequence, I just sample psi uh, independently. So this is a mixture of IID sequences. Every IID sequence is exchangeable. So the mixture is exchangeable as well. This is a nice kind of yeah, representation of, of getting such sequences. And then Definetti's theorem says that every infinite exchangeable sequence is of that form. So that's great. We do we have a whole sequence and all we need to do is find the distribution over distributions that gave rise to it and we can use this representation. There's a nice uh, categorical version of this due to uh, Sam Staten and Bart Jacobs, uh, where you look at sequences over multisets here and then the set of distributions in this category of channels becomes a limit. And it's in a category of channels, so to give a map into this is to give a distribution of distribution, so it has this kind of two-layered nature. But if you set it up right, then you can state Definetti's theorem as every exchangeable sequence factors uniquely through the multinomial channel, right? Uh, but remember, hypergeometric is not an infinite sequence, so we can't use this result. We need to use like a finite fragment of Definetti and really see what goes wrong. And this is also a very classical result. This is known, this is even a strategy to prove Definetti's theorem is to see what happens in the finite case. So any distribution doesn't need to uh, extend uh, infinitely. Any distribution is exchangeable if and only if it is a sign mixture of multinomial distributions. So here's a nice picture. Here's the set of all distributions. And then this curve is the multinomial distributions. And uh, this is the convex, so those are the proper non-signed mixtures. And then here is some space for signed mixtures where uh, we, need, we need affine combinations of this curve to go into here, whereas we only need convex combinations here. And then Definetti's theorem says, as this becomes more and more high dimensional, basically this green area shrinks to zero and then everything is represented as an ordinary mixture. But okay, we have this green area, we can go there with negative probabilities, that's fine. So what we want to do is find uh, sign definitive representations for hypergeometric N. Again, there's many of them, so let's try to pick a good one. Now we need Bernstein polynomials. You might know them, you, you get them if you take this uh, expression here, x plus one minus x to the N and expand with the binomial theorem then you get these summons here, and this is the Bernstein polynomial by definition, has some index nk, but you can also index them by multisets, which I'm gonna do, then like this, this index battle uh, becomes a bit better. They look like this, they have a bunch of really nice properties, so they're linearly independent, they sum to one, well, I've written it, they, they must sum to one. Um, and yeah, they have a surprising array of, of applications, I'll show you three that are relevant. So the big application is they come up in computer graphics all the time. If you draw Bezier curves, which are these uh, smooth interpolations between, uh, between points, and then this is a polynomial and this is exactly given by Bernstein polynomial. But they also come up in probability theory at two related places. The first of all is the binomial distribution, which is given by that likelihood if you know it, and this is exactly the Bernstein polynomial. Oh, I switched KN up here. Bernstein uh, KN evaluated it. P, and they also come up as the densities of the beta distribution. If you know the beta distribution, it's a distribution over the unit interval, which uh, also kind of by definition is a Bernstein polynomial with some scaling and then normalized. So yeah, these Bernstein polynomials, they are the density functions of the beta distribution. And the two things are related. So by construction, the beta is the conjugate prior to the binomial distribution if you do if you do inference. So yeah, famous places for Bernstein polynomials now. Uh, what can we do? Oh yeah, this is a cool factor. If you draw the curve of binomial distributions 
like here in this three space, here in two space, uh, they are Bezier curves. Cool. Um, right, so, so how does this come together? It's well known that the Definetti representation for Polya's urn is beta. Okay, so we said every exchangeable thing factors through multinomials, we're in the case n equals two, so we can write uh, Polya's draw n as first sample beta classically composition uh, binomial. And then if we like really go, go down to uh, integrating that out, uh, we have this continuous mixture here where we say Polya n of like these two multisets, but they're really numbers of uh, phi and xi is uh, evaluate the binomial distribution here, which is this Bernstein polynomial, and then integrate that against a beta sample, which is here. So this is a great formula because it has two times Bernstein polynomials in like two different places. And this gives polya draw, so drawing with the duplication. What can we do with hypergeometric? Wouldn't it be nice to, to keep the story almost intact and say, can we find a sort of dual beta such that hypergeometric n is a mixture of, again, Bernstein against something that I'm going to write dual beta. What are these things? So formally, the question is, uh, can we find this? Can we find signed probability densities, d phi, such that it interpolates hypergeometric, so for, for all uh, smaller things, and then for all multisets here, we have this equation. Okay, we can uh, simplify this a bit by plugging in a special case. Remember, if uh, phi has n elements, then drawing n times from it hypergeometrically, we know exactly what we're going to get. So um, if we plug in these multisets of size exactly n, we know what we want to get. If it is equal to phi, then it should, have, it should return probability 1. So we put a, a Dirac delta here, and if... Uh, Xi is not equal to phi, then it should be probability zero, because we know exactly what it should be. So this is just encoding this uh, delta, uh, this um, Dirac equation here uh, as a mixture. So it's necessary that it satisfies that, but you can also show that this equation is sufficient. So if it's correct on these length n things, it's also correct for all uh, smaller things. So this is really the equation that we want to solve. There are many solutions. What's the simplest one? The simplest one is to use linear algebra and think a bit, a bit, uh, think a bit about bases. So if you have a Hilbert space and it has a basis of bi's, you can define the dual basis of di's to be the unique basis defined by this relation in a product of bi to dj is delta ij. If your bi is orthogonal, then it's dual to itself, uh, or orthonormal, then it's dual to itself. But like you can take any basis, plug this in, and you will get a dual basis out, which is the basis of the dual space in some sense, and they are related by this. And there's also a procedure for computing the dual basis by like taking the Gramian matrix of your original basis, inverting it, and then you get the coefficients. Okay, so we can do this to the Bernstein polynomials because they are a basis of polynomials of degree n. We said that before. So we can define dual Bernstein polynomials, which are defined by this equation with respect to the Bernstein polynomials. Guess what? This is an old concept. And uh, it's in a bunch of computer graphics papers because BZ is blinds. And like there's formulas for it. I have not seen any connection with probability theory. So I found that striking. That's what they look like. This one is nice. They're a bit, you see like they go into the negative. Uh, but yeah, each uh, dual Bernstein polynomial is assigned probability density. And the argument is really simple, where we could say it's by construction, but we can also just check it. So assigned probability density, it should integrate to one, so we plug it in here. Uh, we insert a one here because the sum of the Bernstein polynomials is one. We switch sum and integral, and now this is the defining equation. So this integral is just delta ij. So we got one. Great, so this uh, kind of computer graphics concept actually is assigned probability distribution. And I mean, I say it as a theorem, but by, by construction, each dual Bernstein polynomial defines a definite representation of hypergeometric. And once we have this definite <laughs> representation, we can just keep drawing to infinity. And for the first n things where it makes sense, it will coincide with hypergeometric. And then it will give us uh, weird negative stuff. And this is exactly the way I got to the quarter, 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 quarter thing in the beginning. 
I don't have a good intuition why those numbers. You have a big matrix and you invert it, right? But this is what comes out. And I, I would say this is a kind of canonical story to, to get there. So, uh, yeah, let's see what we have. We wanted to find a definitive representation for hypergeometric draws. It does require negative probabilities, but if we're willing to accept that, we get a consistent and exchangeable extension uh, that explains all these overdraws. Um, and I think dual Bernstein polynomials are a very canonical solution. Are they the only one? No. There's, there's others, like in the paper, that talked about um, finite definitivity. You can, you can come up with uh, different bases, and it always kind of comes down to in inverting a certain matrix. Uh, but it doesn't use polynomials, so it uses discrete, discrete representations as opposed to continuous mixtures. And I think this one is particularly nice. I'm not aware that there are any explicit formulas except for the two-dimensional dual Bernstein polyno polynomials. So this one by Jutla, there is an explicit formula. It's not nice, but, but it exists. Not saying it's useful, um, but yeah. So the probabilistic uh, interpretation of dual Bernstein is novel, as far as I know. The story is very elegant categorically, and it also extends uh, for the non-binary case if we use Dirichlet and multinomial instead of uh, Bernstein and Beta. This is in the paper. We keep the analogy between hypergeometric and and Polya, and then if you have like if you want to do Bayesian inference, which Again, it's tricky with signed probabilities, but the formulas are really nice because if we have a, a product of a um, Bernstein polynomial and a dual Bernstein polynomial, then we can use this defining equation to, to kind of reduce integrals. So yeah, that was the story. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the fun talk. Any questions? Yeah, Pavel. Yes. Uh, so, first question: um, Is this, uh, especially with the with this uh, inverse Bernstein polynomial, is it an, an instance of Möbius inversion? I I thought that. I'm not sure. Not not trivially, but I, so yeah. In the end, what you have is you have a matrix full of some sort of combinatorial objects. In this case, it's, uh, it's multinomial coefficients and you want to have a combinatorial formula for inverting that. Sometimes if you massage it right, this does indeed become Möbius inversion. I've tried and it hasn't helped. If you have a good idea, definitely. Yeah, then and. And another question, which I guess is related, is like in continuous time probability theory, sometimes you have negative things, which can usually be interpreted as the tangent space to the simplex. And so you can go in all directions, and that's why you get negatives. Would this be something like that, except in discrete? So we have formal differences, and could we interpret it in that way? I don't know. I, I don't know about this tangent space stuff. Sounds great. Thank you. The other, okay. This seems vaguely related to improper priors. I can say more about what I mean, but do you, do you see it as related? Sure, so um, there's an improper prior that you can use for, for by, over binomial distributions where the, the prior probability is proportional to 1 over p times my, 1 minus p. Um, and that kind of behaves like an urn that initially has no balls in it. Um, so, so that kind of has this drawing from an empty urn feeling. So it's, I mean, it's very much this domain of question. I mean, the, like this question of I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? 
So for uh, the uh, other Definetti theorems, we wrote a paper and uh, Paolo and Thomas and uh, Bias wrote a paper. Is, is there some universal property for the signed measures that could come from or some? Oh, it's, it's, not, it's not gonna be so nice. Like this limit story is, is re really extremely beautiful because it, it completely and then if you go to the go to the signed ones, it loses uniqueness. Um, it's more like the interest in doing that is that you give more like quantitative approximation. More basically, you have an exchangeable sequence, and you're asking, can I extend this infinitely exchangeably? If you can, then you you're already here, so you're a your um, convex combination of, of these ID sequences. If there's some sort of obstruction to being extended beyond a certain length, then this shows up at, at, as negativity of coefficients. And then you can show the more you can extend, the more these negative things converge to zero in, in some uh, approximate sense. And there's results on that, but I, I think it's, there's no kind of absolute result it would have to be. Thanks so much for answering my question, my original question with the talk. Um, so, so are you familiar with Dirichlet processes at all? Um, do you see this? Have you thought about like connections between this and Dirichlet processes and what the implications might be for the applications of, or you know, application settings where you could apply a Dirichlet process? Does this give you something that you couldn't do before? I'm not sure. So Dirichlet processes are the, if if x becomes uh, continuous or uh, um, big problem is that computing. I mean, the the beta distribution is is nice because we have these. Uh, so in Definitive theorem, you can take the definite representation of each finite fragment and they will converge. And in this case, they converge to the beta distribution of the tractable object. In the negative case, they don't converge. You have one for each given starting urn, and then they are given by these rather more chaotic polynomials, which as far as I know, you have to invert some big matrix. So I don't think numerically this is... Um, I wouldn't be surprised if a formal story of this would work out. Thanks. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.